it was an attempt to begin reconciliation. I don't okay. think we believed. I think we thought we might be able to start a conversation which would lead to the education okay. in the schools and what have you of the story so that the community would know. Welcome to The Race to Social Justice, a podcast that explores the myriad racial and social challenges facing the modern world with your hosts, Kiva White and John Kepner. Thank you for being part of the Courageous Conversation, because when it comes to combating social injustices in America, it is not about being confrontational. It is about being conversational. And good evening, John. Ah, good evening, Kiva. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing awesome. Thank you. Good to see you, sir. Happy New Year to you. And welcome, everyone, to our Race and Social Justice podcast series. I'm Kiva White. As you can see, I am the black guy of the duel. And I'm John Kepner. I'm the white guy. And Kiva and I share a love of the letter K, K for Kiva and K for Kepner, but more importantly, K for knowledge, what we try to impart on the subject of racial and equity justice. Yeah, and you know, the goal of our podcast is to really promote racial and social equity and justice throughout honest and even oftentimes difficult conversations and dialogue. Mm -hmm. And we like to call these conversations courageous conversations you know, John and I, over the years, we have found these discussions uh, amongst ourselves to really deepen our respective understandings of racism and our personal responsibilities in that regard. And, you know, this has led us to um, develop this platform here, the Race to Social Justice podcast, where we invite guests to share their honest experiences and, and learnings that they want to share with our listeners and our viewers. And we really hope these conversations uh, really help everyone that are that are tuning into our show and even our guests in our, our own personal journeys to impact social change in our communities and, and around the nation. So we thank you all for joining us again for another show. So John, who is our guest today? Well, our guest is uh, a friend and colleague of mine, uh, Ray Solomon. And uh, Ray has a distinguished academic background, and as many uh, academic uh, professors and so forth, uh, his uh, list of accomplishments is, is way beyond uh, my ability to uh, really <laughs> reflect. Um, uh, Ray and I uh, are uh, classmates from college, so we go back, I'm, I'm, I'm happy or embarrassed to say well over 15 years. <laughs> Uh, he's going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but uh, Ray went on after college to get his law degree and and uh, his PhD in in history, wow. uh, legal history at uh, University of Chicago, and went on to clerk for a, um, a chief judge of the uh, the Sixth Circuit. Is that right? right? Um, and uh, eventually landed uh, in our backyard here in Philadelphia in Camden where he served for, oh, what is it, uh, 16 years as the dean of the law school at Rutgers Camden, uh, mm -hmm. and then later became the provost of, of, of the, the school, the, the entire school. Um, and, and with many stops along the way and many publications along the way that you would normally say, um, we, connect, we reconnected uh, at a couple of reunions, I think our 40th and then our 50th reunion, and um, uh, got together after that when I realized he was local and we could do that. And we were both entering retirement years. And, um, and uh, Ray joined a board with me uh, called the HealthSpark Foundation. It's a foundation board that in and of itself is, would be an interesting topic for this, uh, yeah. this podcast because it really is doing transformative thing in, in our county, in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, in terms of racial justice. But um, I could go on and on. Um, but um, I'm, I'm really, really delighted uh, that, you've asked, that you've agreed to, to talk with us tonight, Ray. And I'm going to start, and then um, Kiva will follow up with a question. But when we reconnected, uh, I was surprised when we were talking about our backgrounds to learn that you were from Arkansas, of all places. Um, and uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, we talked about a, a bit about you growing up in Arkansas, um, a young Jewish boy growing up in the Deep South. 
and wow. got me to thinking about um, issues around racial discrimination and, and growing up in the South, but also what it was like as a, as a Jewish boy to grow up in the South. So could you talk, of, let's start there with your upbringing, your family and what, why Arkansas and, and that sort of thing. And, and we'll pick up from there. Well, thanks John and Kiva. And I'm delighted uh, to have been asked. Um, so uh, my family on my father's side, the Solomons, uh, came from Germany in the 1850s uh, and moved, uh, came to St. Louis first and then down the Mississippi River uh, to Helena, Arkansas, which is a port city. I mean, it's on the Mississippi and uh, was a, uh, until recently, a, 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 a prosperous uh, city, uh, mid-sized city. Uh, it was about 20,000 people uh, when I was growing up. Um, and it is, uh, topographically, there's a ridge of, of hills that starts in the lower, at the boot hill of Missouri and runs down the western side of the Mississippi and ends uh, literally in Helena. And uh, from Helena to New Orleans on the west side of the river is flat. And that's, so the Delta really begins in, in Helena. And um, it's a, it, it was a cotton producing uh, uh, area. Uh, blues were, uh, was one of the homes of the blues. There's an annual blues festival there. Um, uh, Sonny Boy Williamson, the famous harp player is, uh, was from there and, uh, um, James Cotton uh, was from there. I mean, a no notable uh, blues player. But um, it, in, in that sense, Arkansas um, is a, a state which is sort of in thirds. There's the mountain part in the West, uh, which is now dominated by Walmart and Tyson, where uh, the, the African-American population is not large at all. There's the center of the state, which is Little Rock and uh, it's more industrial and urban. Um, and then there's the Delta, the Eastern part, which is where, where my family lived. Um, and um, it, it, it was, you know, large plantation type uh, economy. Um, it, uh, Helena was um, unusual in certain respects. Um, sort of over, I would say over anti-Semitism um, was, uh, was not as visible in, as in other towns, some 30 miles away, some directly across the river in Mississippi. Um, the example of that is uh, that the country club was started by Jews and, um, and, and Catholics uh, and Protestants. And um, so that but I mean, again, it was racially segregated, but uh, uh, religiously uh, that was fairly, you know, was, was very, was fairly tolerant. I mean, as, you know, as, as these things go. And um, there were, Helena had uh, a Jewish population of about, oh, uh, probably at its peak, 75 to 100 families. Um, in the 1920s, it fell off. It uh, the the post-war boom. My my generation uh, was large. Uh, probably there were about 50 families, and it's a sort of catchment area of about 40 mile radius. Uh, or actually, it's a semicircle because uh, there was occasionally somebody uh, family from Mississippi would come, but mostly they were Arkansas families that would come. And um, uh, we, uh, the, the Jews were um, economically fairly successful there. Uh, uh, my, my grandfather's generation, my great grandfather, my grandfather's generation were in dry goods, were, you know, the sort of uh, typical um, uh, story of Jewish merchants. Uh, they also got into agriculture, uh, farming, cotton business. Uh, the town had, Helena had a, a Jewish mayor in the 1880s, 1890s, I think it was. Um, several elected officials were Jews. The first federal district court judge, U.S. Article III judge in the United States was from Helena, was a distant cousin of, of ours. 
um, Jacob Treber, who was a remarkable jurist. That's a, perhaps another subject, but he was, uh, uh, he, he, in 1903, uh, ruled under the the uh, that under the Thirteenth Amendment, um, it that it reached private action by the predecessor, the precursor of the Klan. They were going around preventing. Um, uh, uh, they were trying to get African Americans fired, uh, black workers fired, uh, various places, and it was it, they were they were brought up. The U.S. Attorney at the judge's request uh, indicted them and um, they uh, he ruled that the 13th amendment the art the article one of the 13th amendment reached that behavior it was reversed by the supreme court in 1905 and in 1968 i believe it is uh in jones versus alfred mayer famous uh, prominent supreme court case the supreme court reversed their earlier position and basically adopted his reasoning, the judge's wow. reason in toto, uh, Potter Stewart wrote the opinion. So it was, it, it was uh, the, the, the town considered itself uh, sort of cosmo cosmopolitan and progressive in many ways. It was still, I mean, I don't wanna make this seem like it was heaven, but, uh, but I mean, it was, it was more so than some towns very nearby, uh, but there was still, I mean, I grew up uh, my father was a lawyer, uh, was a solo practitioner, went to Washington University and then Harvard Law School, married my mother, who was whose family came to Helena in about 19, uh, 1910 or something like that. She was born. And so my father was the, uh, well, I, I am the, the fourth generation to have lived in the town, the third generation born there. My grandfather's entire generation was born there. Um, and, uh, they, um, uh, so, uh, you know, when I was growing up, um, I mean, there were colored and white water fountains. I mean, it was, uh, the schools were totally, uh, segregated. Um, and, um, uh, the, so that a population of 20,000, uh, in terms of my social circle was, you know, half that was roughly 50% African American. Um, and um, the, uh, I mean, it, it was, um, I mean, I mean, Ray, it was, I mean, race was prominent in sort of everyday life. I mean, it was hard to avoid it. Um, it was not a center in the 60s. Uh, there was some SNCC organizing uh, in Helena, but uh, it was not a center of uh, of the civil rights movement in in that sense. So your parents on um, September nineteenth, nineteen nineteen, your parents lived in is it Phillips County where you Phillips County, up? yeah. And they would have been well. My father 10 was ten years old or something like that. No, no, my father was oh. three. He was born in sixteen. Father was, Actually, my mother yeah. was. My mother was born, was only seven months old. And, okay, but your grandparents were adults. Your grandparents, grandparents were adults were. on that date. Right. And um, uh, share with our audience what happened on that date. All right, so um, what, what followed in, uh, from the 29th to October 4th or so was uh, what's, what has become, what is known as, uh, the Elaine Massacre. Um, and it is, I mean, one, there are no official body counts. So one, one doesn't know the, 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 the um, Brian Stevenson's museum in, um, in uh, Montgomery cites the Elaine Massacre as the large, cites Phillips County as the site of the most lynchings in U.S. history, now they they define lynching as any extrajudicial killing. So the 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 the, the town was fairly free of. I mean, in fact, there I, don't, I think there are only like one recorded case of an actual what we think of of lynching in the sense of being hanged um, uh, extrajudicially. Um, but what happened was. Uh, 
sharecropping, which was the economic uh, backbone of, uh, of the post-Civil War period in the South. It was slavery, it was legalized slavery. And it was no different really, think of uh, 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 sharecropping sort of like Pullman or Carnegie's uh, town. It, the landowner uh, would furnish the, the seed and all as a loan. And then uh, the, share, the sharecropper would farm it. And then the planter would buy it from him. Uh, and, um, and the uh, black sharecroppers were always, were perpetually in debt. I mean, basically, because, you know, the, they first, they were probably being cheated on what the sale was, but the interest rates were high and uh, they, there were formal contracts, but they didn't really mean much. Um, so what, what, what had happened was, uh, first of all, you have to understand that the south part of the county uh, was basically virgin forest. Um, and the, in the, around the turn of the 20th century, the Midwestern lumber companies came down and clear cut basically the land would, would ship the, uh, the lumber, the, the trees to lumber mills in Helena or West Helena, they're two towns together. Um, and uh, they, they, the lumber would be milled and then shipped uh, north. So they, these were uh, large tracts, I mean, 5,000, 4,000 acre farms, uh, plantation that were owned by landowners and others uh, and, these and these companies. And the price of cotton had been stable for almost um, 30 years, 20 years at about eight, 12 cents a pound. After World War I, the price spiked. And you had two things. You had black soldiers returning home. These were people who had been promised a better life, you know, by fighting for America's, you know, fighting for freedom. And this, uh, so they, they were coming back and, and you had uh, people who were demanding their, um, their fair share of this increase in price. When the planters refused, uh, they hired a lawyer, form, that former U.S. attorney actually, um, to represent them in, a, in civil suits, but then they started to unionize. And uh, there was a, a union meeting at one of the railroad spurs. There was a ch small church at Hoop Spur. Um, and um, that, uh, the sheriff from Helena sent his deputy down and to investigate, break up, whatever, uh, this meeting. And at this point, there are two narratives that develop a white narrative and a black narrative. So the only way that can be described is shots were fired. It, it, who, who fired first is never going to be known. Um, and uh, the deputy sheriff was killed. And that sent a panic in the in, in Helena, there were rumors that that the blacks uh, had a list of plantation owners they were going to kill. So a posse was formed. Uh, posses came from Mississippi to assist. And over the next four days, there was indiscriminate killing. And after the first day, um, uh, the um, the the a group of elite, business elite, uh, and Helena tried to said, you know, this has gone too far. So they, they petitioned to, uh, sold to the governor to send the National Guard in essence, but these are army troops that had just come back from the war. They had machine guns, you know, mounted machine gun. And uh, so the army came ostensibly to quell the violence, but what happened was Apparently, through friendly fire, two soldiers were killed. By all accounts, it seems to be friendly fire. And at that, the army decided to indiscriminately kill. Uh, and 
So you had African Americans who thought the army was there to protect them coming out of the, the cane rushes and what have you, and they were just mowed down. At the end of the day, it's not, as I said, it's not known whether more people were killed in, than in Tulsa, but the estimates, uh, probably the low estimate is 100, and probably the, the reasonable high estimate is like 200 people were killed. Five whites were killed. Uh, and immediately after this, um, there was a, um, there, there were mass arrests. And of the, 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 no whites were ever arrested for killing of blacks, but uh, there were around 200 people arrested, of the, of the African Americans were arrested and taken to jail in Helena. But what then happened was um, the, uh, it was October, which is cotton picking time. So the, the planters wanted to get their crops out of the field. So they went down and they, they got pro uh, somewhere like 160, I don't know, the, don't remember the exact number, were released to their, their, they were vouched for that they were, you know, that they weren't part of the union organization or anything. They were released. And then trials were held. Now, during the time that people were detained in jail, they were beaten and tortured um, and uh, finally brought to trial. Trials were, they were given, um, I mean, everything you can think of um, in describing a kangaroo trial um, was occurred in this instance. They were, they were, um, people were, uh, the jurists consisted of people who were in the posse. Uh, there were, um, the, 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 the defense lawyer had like four minutes to interview people. The trials lasted 15 minutes. The jury was out 10 to 15 minutes. They were convicted and, and went on. So um, what, what then happened was uh, that there was, um, basically 12 were sentenced to death. The, 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 and that's the story really focuses on the 12 sentenced to death. They had six of them were convicted um, improperly. They were, they were convicted of murder. There is no crime of murder. It's either first degree or second degree murder. So the Arkansas Supreme Court overturned their convictions. The other six were, um, were, um, convicted uh, properly and their appeal to the Arkansas Supreme Court uh, was denied. I mean, they lost in the Arkansas Supreme Court and certiorari that was not granted. So they were sentenced, they were due to be uh, hanged or uh, I think, yeah, it's hanged. Um, and the hero of the story is an ex-slave African-American lawyer named Scipio Africanus Jones who took their defense after the, the initial kangaroo trial. And it's a long involved story and I, we don't have time to go through all of it, but through just brilliant lawyering, he got the six whose, 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 whose trial was reversed. Um, he got them off basically on a technicality on a speedy trial act violation under Arkansas law. And those six uh, were spared. The other six, through some maneuvering, including Jacob Treber uh, hearing, having a federal habeas case, um, what their, their conviction ultimately on the, on, the, on the habeas went to the US Supreme Court, where up until this time, in the case is Moore versus Dempsey, it's 1923, up until that time, basically, habeas corpus, the federal courts would not interfere in a state conviction as long as there was a, 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 a literally a man in a black robe in the front of the room and there was a right to an appeal to the state on any, you know, on some ground or another. Uh, the federal courts would say that's none of our business. It, it, the rights of, of, of the defendants didn't matter. In more uh, Holmes, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. wrote 
uh, an opinion for the court, seven to two, the two racists, Van Der Venner and I've uh, forgotten the other one, um, dissented, overturning the, uh, the granting the habeas, which would allow a retrial. Um, and I, I'll explain that in a minute, but in a second, but let me just say, um, so what happened then was Jones had to go back and convince um, the, um, Jones had to convince the governor, the, the town folk of Helena, the white elite of Helena and the NAACP all to that, that time served was the best thing that they didn't want to retrial because he didn't really have the evidence to, because um, what, what, what the court, what happened was before the first trial, a mob formed to go to the, to take these people out of the jail and lynch them. Oh my God. 12 people. But the, the, as I was saying, Helena sort of perceived itself as cosmopolitan and didn't want this to occur. So they said to the, 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 the mob, look, we, we don't, don't, don't go in and take them out of the jail. We're gonna try them and we'll lynch them legally, basically. So, you know, go disperse. So the mob dispersed, but in the pleading, um, when, when, when Jones was, uh, Jones, it's, Jones was, was uh, responsible for the legal argument in the Supreme Court, but the NAACP, which was financing it, wouldn't allow him to argue. I think partly they didn't trust, you know, a self-taught lawyer. They got a Harvard educated white lawyer to go before the Supreme Court. Partly it was tactical. I'm sure that they were afraid that they'd lose five votes off the top if they had a black lawyer in front of the Supreme Court in 1923. Um, so, but, but Jones had, had pled, it was again, a technicality, but it was brilliant pled that the trial was mob dominated because in the Leo Frank case, <laughs> talking about anti-Semitism, um, the Leo Frank case, which was the white Georgia Jew who was, um, who was lynched, before he was lynched, his case went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court in a kind of throwaway, throwaway line, although he lost 9-0, or 7-2 rather, the other way, uh, Holmes and Brandeis dissenting. Uh, in a throwaway line, the majority said, of course, if a, tri a trial were mob dominated, then uh, there, we, the federal courts would have to intervene. And, uh, mm -hmm. he, and so Jones pleaded that it was mob dominated. That was, his, that was what the record showed, or, or that's what he stated. And the Arkansas Supreme Court, sorry to get into legal technicality, the Arkansas Supreme, I mean, sorry, Arkansas Attorney General demurred. So the Supreme Court was in the position of taking the facts as stated, which meant that the trial was mob dominated. So Holmes got to write this opinion, but there was no evidence that the, the trial was actually mob dominated. It had all sorts of procedural irregularities, I see. but yeah. there wasn't a mob there. So he wanted it settled with the time served rather than, but he spared their lives. And one, let me just do the footnote of this. There, so this case is the sort of um, what you might call the 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 um, bay, the the base of the tree from which all of the criminal justice reforms from 1925 to 1970, with the when the Burger Court came in, it's it's they all came from this case in a sense. I mean, this was the first, and secondly. There was a, when the NAACP was trying to decide whether to get involved, Walter White, uh, who was just hired by the NAACP and was very light skinned. So they sent him down to pose as a Chicago Sun Times reporter, um, uh, a, a white reporter, to investigate whether they should get involved. And he goes down and he, he it, it, it's very formative in his experience. I mean, this whole two days, he, there's, he embellishes the story in his autobiography, but the point is uh, he came back, recommended at the NAACP uh, finance pretty much this operation or help finance it. And White then becomes the 30 year, 40 year 
leader of the NAACP. So it, this case was, he, this was the first victory the NAACP ever had. They had been doing anti-lynching legislation for years and getting nowhere, being, they, they got knocked down every time in the Congress. They get this victory in the federal courts. He then sees this as a road, the federal courts as a possible road. And so you can trace Brown yeah. to this yeah. case. Um, there's a, a political scientist who's written a book on this that, that I mean, I, the only thing I disagree with her about, I agree with her that this is the, the base, the trunk of the tree yeah. that, that leads to Brown, but she, because she only uses the NAACP records, she denies um, the agency of Scipio Africanus Jones. So it, it, it mm. becomes about the NAACP, not about that. But yeah. anyway, so that's the long, the long version. So, yeah, so mm. a couple of just quick thoughts, and then I'm going to sure. ask you, Kiva, for yeah. your reaction to this story, because wow. you've read a little bit about it, but you haven't heard the first thing. Number one is we have just been treated to a just a great lecture by a legal historian. <laughs> Unbelievable. Second reaction is, um, I wonder what Hollywood would do with this. Well, funny you should ask. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Because, so the best book on this um, uh, is um, uh, Bob Whitaker, Robert Whitaker, who's a journalist, but um, he wrote a, a really definitive, it, there's an earlier book uh, by an Arkansan, uh, Griff Stockley, who uh, who first sort of raised this and did a lot of the uh, a lot of the background research, but Bob really does much more authority. It's a much more authoritative book, and um, he uh, his book is is called uh, On the Laps of God, um, and he he's been um, somebody approached him to do a six part mini series you know, sort of historically accurate and all. Mm -hmm. Then COVID came, the project wow. got somewhat derailed. And now uh, there appears to be in, in the Hollywood press uh, announcement of a movie. I don't, sorry, I don't remember who the star is, uh, but it's gonna be a fictionalized. I mean, the, 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 the story itself as ac historically accurate, has all the plot turns and everything. I mean, you oh, just, yeah. I mean, these people are saved from death three times by this lawyer. Yeah. Um, and and um, it's just, but Hollywood's gonna, you know, make him in. Oh, they'll change it. They'll yeah, change they, it. Yeah, they're but, gonna make mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but, but the the reason I mentioned that is the, one of the things we're finding with our podcasts are the power of stories. Right. Yeah. And because people can relate to stories and you've, you've brought this story to life, it's significant and it could be a real educational thing for, for people. Right. And, then, and then my final comment as you were talking is um, critical race theory, that, that this is not known. I mean, Right. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a well, you know, pretty well-educated, sensitive white guy and I didn't know about Tulsa until two years ago, right? And I didn't know about this. And these, these, these are factual things. They need to be told honestly, like you have as an historian. I mean, historians don't, you know, you go with the facts where the facts lead you. Now you're, this is your right. home home territory, and you're, there are probably some, you know, emotional things. We'll get to that. What 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 you and your family have done in reaction to this, but. Kiva, I've been asking all the questions. What are your I, thoughts having heard this? I mean, I've, I've just been taking all of this in and I know, you know, <clears throat> one of the things we teach uh, the course uh, Diversity and Oppression at the School of Social Work is, you know, we ask the students, why is it important to uncover history? And Ray just gave a, a real stamp of approval of why it's important to do that because as, as we all know, in this country, history can be handled in one of two ways. It could be undocumented or underreported. And there's a, there's a reason why, you know, because this, I mean, 
I've never heard of the Elaine massacre. And however, it reminds me of um, Black Wall Street in Tulsa, what happened, what happened there. And so I'm thinking about, you know, the politics behind um, not, uh, not um, you know, curtailing the, uh, the ugly reality of racism because now you have Tulsa, Oklahoma, and now you have this one. And if all of these atrocities are just uh, exposed, so to speak, it really, it really can, uh, you know, put a, a, a negative stamp on the United States as a, as a country and the democracy and all of all the civil liberties and freedoms that this country stands for. However, I think history is very important um, to understand that this thing happened in 1919, uh, a little over a century ago, 100 years ago. And, and the, so the question I would ask is how far have we come from that? Well, and not just, and not just you know, not just the killing part, because that still is happening, but it's just happening in a different, now it's happening with police brutality and, and shootings and, 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 and that nature. However, listening to you describe, Ray, the legal system back then is no different than some of the things I'm seeing in, in some of the high profile courts now. So it, it, it's, um, I guess for me, it's really, it's enlightening to learn and understand history. And at the same time, it can be a little um, oppressive, if not depre depressing, to know that we haven't really made a lot of changes as it relates to the legal system and the fair play uh, that people of color uh, should be afforded. So I, I read the story about Scipio, and if it wasn't for him, those those twelve individuals would have definitely got hung. Oh, <laughs> they would have they would they got, yeah. they would have gotten lynched. And I think about you know um, um, legal representation and the affordability of a lawyer. And, and you know an African American community and how if you don't have the right lawyer if you have a public defender if you don't have the right lawyers on your team if you are in some type of legal challenge uh, you have some really you're gonna face some real challenges from a legal standpoint so I just think I just thank you for sharing that and really given like the legal the legal implications of of the of that situation because you know um, it's not just it's not just social problems. It's political problems. It's, right. it's legal legal issues that we have to continue to contend with in this country. And one of the things I teach my kids, I teach my kids three areas of life that they need to be proficient in, system wise. Systems, the financial systems, know how to manage your money. The political system, know who's in charge and who you vote for. And then the legal system understand the law because if you understand the law and you have a historical context of the law it will prevent you hopefully from getting into you know a bad you know a bad situation and so i thank you for for sharing um you know the historical um you know steps of this of this um, elaine massacre because i mean 100 and 100 to 300 african american lives and we think about equity uh, you know that's you know, I'm not, not saying that any lives, loss of life, I'm not celebrating the loss of life of one race or another. Sure. However, five white people in comparison to 300 African-American individuals dying during that, during that, during that incident, it's a, just a, an atrocity. And then to learn that the military actually, you know, again. Yeah, that was. Yeah, so yeah, yeah that, you know, understand that the military was, you know, we're thinking, yeah, they're here to help us and, and calm down the, the problem. And then that was turned on us. So it just it just really talks about the oppressive nature of, of these uh, these incidents and how it still can permeate in society today. So one uh, I, I follow up a uh, little bit on that with. Um, so I, I was unaware of this, too, until uh, I think it was. Uh, I don't even think it was in college. I think it was in graduate school when I began to, to learn about this. So yeah. one of the things that had happened, and, and an elderly, um, uh, elderly African American man said to my brother once um, uh, that uh, who had been alive, who was from that area, uh, was a small boy, I think, when when it happened. Um, uh, he 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 basically said, uh, "We keep 
kicking this under the rug and all we do is keep tripping over it. I mean, it's a wonderful image. Huh. You know? Yeah, it is. Because, I mean, as you can understand several things, one is uh, the, the, the white population um, attitude was that's the past, we don't have to talk about it, let's don't deal with it. The mm -hmm. African-American population, many of them scattered after this. I mean, they just, these are sharecroppers. I mean, they, it wasn't like they had permanent roots in this, in the town. Some stayed and yeah. there are descendants in the lane today uh, in the county, uh, but many, many scattered. But there's also the class difference. The reason, part of the reason, even after Tulsa was a known story because John Hope Franklin, actually one of my former professors, um, his father was a prosperous lawyer in Tulsa, and mm. they, they they moved to Nashville during the, the because of the Tulsa uh, riots and massacre. Uh, so, um, you know, th that was a wealthy community. This was th these were poor people, and you know, neither none of the locals had any reason to want to perpetuate the story, and nationally, no one perpetuated it. So yeah. Um, so, but I, I, I so um, I, I guess to uh, tell you the, the follow-up to this was, um, I, I mean, I agree completely with both of you that uh, it, it's really Brian Stevenson's point for his museum. Unless you understand your history, you can't get past it. You know, you, yeah. you, you, mm -hmm. you, you can, you can be, uh, you should be burdened by it, but you you can't yeah. you can't deal with it unless you understand it and and have some sense of it, um, and yeah. um, and and so uh, probably in around 2016 or so, my brother, uh, my older brother David, met a, a at a, a party, saw a friend of someone he had gone to Harvard with as an undergraduate, but. Um, they, they hadn't really, they both were in New York and it turned out that uh, this person's grandfather, he learned his, his kindly grandfather who, who helped raise him, um, he, learned, uh, he learned had been part of the posse uh, and had undoubtedly shot at or murdered people. And this is someone who is a, a, a very, um, uh, a religious person in, at uh, he's sort of head of the social action committee. I think it's at uh, Trinity Church in New York um, mm -hmm. and um, is very involved in civil rights and things like that. And he learned it. And he, he, there's a whole um, sort of story uh, that he, he met one of the descendants, the great grandniece, I think, or great granddaughter of, of one of the um, uh, of one of the uh, blacks who was uh, uh, tried and uh, and her grandmother, uh, whenever she mentioned it would become hysterical. I mean, would, wouldn't talk about it. Um, and, uh, and so he and uh, uh, Chester Johnson and Sheila Walker basically uh, met and really developed this friendship and reconciliation of, of trying to understand uh, each other's history. And, and, uh, uh, and they, uh, Chester's written a book, Damaged Heritage, um, about this. And they, I think they, they may have, there are a couple of filmed interviews of the two of them uh, doing conversations. But um, anyway, Chester and my brother met and, mm started talking about doing something for the 100th anniversary to try to, again, to get people to deal with it. And uh, out of that came a, a really uh, a biracial committee. Um, the chief judge of the, of the Eastern District of Arkansas, uh, Brian Miller was um, chair uh, of that group. Uh, and he, he and his brother, Kyle, who heads the Delta Cultural Center in Helena, um, a state agency, uh, state museum, uh, they, they lost four great uncles in the massacre uh, who were not part of, they were not sharecroppers, they were fairly prosperous uh, 
uh, family in, um, I mean, a, a upper middle class African American family, and um, their their uh, these four uncles just were in the wrong place. They were coming back from a hunting trip and were dragged off the train and <laughs> murdered. Um, it's never known by whom. Uh, there's suspicions, but uh, they're never. But anyway, that's so. Uh, this group decided to do something to uh, to build a memorial to the incident, and uh, we dedicated it on the hundredth anniversary. Um, there were probably 500 people there, over 500 people at the dedication, whites and blacks, um, and um, it's a, a, a rather simple design. Uh, it's architecturally quite quite beautiful, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and um, uh, and so and there's a there's a, a YouTube film uh, called uh, of concrete and steel uh, yeah. that anybody can watch, which is a we'll we'll uh, post it with the with the uh, yeah oh good because it's it's it's, yeah. it's important uh, it's important um, yeah but I mean we had no we had no I mean we got. We got attacked from both the left and the right. The 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 right, uh, mostly white, um, uh, attitude was, "Why are you bringing this up? A hundred years? I mean, what you would imagine?" Yeah. Uh, yeah. We were attacked from the a group of uh, a small group uh, of people in Elaine. You have to understand that the killings were all over the South County. They weren't, it got the name Elaine because there were, you know, a thousand people in Elaine as opposed to 200 people in those other little towns. Um, and uh, it, that, it was called the Elaine Massacre, but, but it happened all over. And we put the memorial in Helena between the courthouse, which is the same courthouse where these people were tortured uh, and the federal courthouse were the site of the federal, it's a new federal court building, but it's the site of where they were, the habeas trial took place. So we put it there on public property. And, um, you know, they believe that yet again, the whites in Helena, even though again, it was a biracial group, were appropriating what should belong in, in Elaine. I didn't view this as an either or, I viewed it as um, uh, we could do both. Uh, and there'd be that memorial, and we could have gotten had we had had we not had this controversy, we might have gotten the Brian Stevenson uh, duplicate memorial, you know, monument, because that's the way the museum is designed uh, to to give a duplicate of their of the of the uh, lynching plaques, uh, as it were, um, and we could have put that in Elaine, but. It, it didn't, it wasn't to be, uh, but, uh, you know, we, I think uh, uh, we didn't have any false sense that we were bringing about reconcil uh, total reconciliation or something because the town is now still very divided racially. Yeah. It's, 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 a, it's yeah. not a good scene. Yeah, I was wondering, was the motivation reconciliation, guilt, you yeah. know, what, what, what? I, I would say I, I would I wouldn't say I would say it was an it was an attempt to begin reconciliation. I don't okay. think we believed. I think we we believe yeah. we we thought we might be able to start a conversation which would lead to the education in the schools and what have you of the story, so that the community would know. We didn't believe that somehow it, it would bring about uh, a, a transformation necessarily. Uh, has it done that? It's, I, I think at the margins, uh, it's been, um, you know, I don't, I mean, one never knows. I mean, guilt is always sort of hard to figure out, <laughs> but, um, yeah. you know, it's, 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 but, you know, do, do we feel some responsibility as a community? Yes. You know, to, 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 uh, and um, at the beginning of the film, uh, the federal judge is talking about how maybe there's a chance once maybe this is the first step in, uh, as he sort of talks about, you know, dispersing the 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 bad spirits that have hung yeah. over the town yeah. all these years. I mean, I I I I don't know that you know. I mean, it's still it's still difficult situation. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's yeah. 
Yeah. I just, I, I'm going to just, just say, uh, you know, sure. you, nobody, nobody wants to preserve the optics of oppression. And that's, that's what I've come to realize in these situations. Why? So when we, when we ask the question, why are certain histories hidden? Is I believe that the optics of oppression, nobody wants to deal, want, don't want to really face the reality of what this country's true history is all about. I mean, there's some good things about yeah. being, about the, the United States. However, there are some ugly things. And when those are uncovered, you know, um, the dominant culture, white America ha has a challenge with that because now there's this reflective, this, this, this reflective exercise that you would have to do um, and within the, thyself to say, to ask the question, have I behaved in that way? Or do I behave in that way unconsciously? Have I caused any damage to individuals unbeknownst to me? Um, am I uh, um, contributing to the oppressive systems in society? And in the literature, we call that cognitive dissonance. Right. And, there's a, and so cognitive dissonance is like, how, how can we behave in such a way as the uh, Elaine massacres, as the Oklahoma, Oklahoma massacres? On one hand, that's how we, that's our history. But on the other hand, we say we're the land of the free, the home of the brave, liberty and justice for all, um, equality, and all. This. So this oil is an oil and what I call it oil and water reality is the history and the reality and the existence of this country. They don't mix, and so I think for people of color, I would say for for me, I was just I, won't, I can't speak for everybody, all people of color. Um, I know for me, when history is uncovered there's a little bit of psychological trauma that I experienced, even while you were talking about this just now. Right. So there's psychological trauma and there's racial trauma for us that, that we may experience. And I think on the other side of the aisle, where, as it relates to white America, it's this sense of cognitive dissonance that this, this internal battle between um, this is the history and I represent some of that history, I represent some of that history just from a racial standpoint or even from a social class standpoint. So now I got to ask myself a question, do I contribute to the oppressive nature of this country? And I think, so that's why a lot of, a lot of these stories, a lot of these things, are, are like you said, like the guy said, we just keep sweeping it, sweeping it under the rug and tripping over it because we don't, we don't expose it, we don't talk about it. And I think the reason why mo I know people of color, we're tired of hearing about these atrocities and nothing is changing. Um, I like monuments, I like marches, but what would make it real for me is change in the law. Like the 13th Amendment and how that was written, it was, it was a loophole to keep people in an oppressive state. And so I think changing the law and, 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 and um, you know, effective, um, criminal justice reform is gonna be the way to start, you know, preventing some of these things hopefully from happening in generations to come. But it's clear from just from this, this, this conversation, a hundred years later, we're still seeing a diff the same behaviors because there's no change in the laws. Right. Well, and also it's economics too. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's also the, the, the economic system, um, you know, well, the pay, I mean, pay, pay equity, pay equity is what was happening with the sharecroppers. Right. And people of color are still fighting for pay equity. That's right. why I went into business for myself. I got tired of people telling me to go to school, get an education, get a high level degree. I have a master's degree. I hold two licenses in every single place I've worked. I was getting paid less than my white counterpart. So it's no different than what those sharecroppers was fighting for back right. then in 1919. No. We still yeah. have the yeah. same pay equity you know, challenges now. So. I think the other, another perspective on this um, is what, faced with this honest history, yeah. what's our responsibility? Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. what, what do we, what are we always responsible to do about it? Yeah. And, and, um, and it could be legislation, it could be a lot of things. Uh, but um, I think it's too easy, particularly for white people, to say that was the past. That's 100 years ago. Yeah. You know, it's not me. That's not my problem. Yeah, right. 
but it is at an individual, I believe at an individual and in a collective level, it is our problem. And we, mm. we, we need to, we need to correct it somehow. And there yeah. are difficult issues. If you talk about reparations and things like that, they're difficult right. issues to sort through, but, but um, that, that was one of the things that I began to realize a couple of years ago when I really started thinking about these things, you know, we, we bear responsibility. Now yeah. um, I'm going to suggest something here because there are at least four or five other really great topics okay. yeah. that I'd like uh, Ray to great. weigh in on. And I think given the fact that we've got, you know, we're well into the hour that we ought to do a part two, if you're willing to do that, Ray. Sure. And, sure. and, 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 um, and just cover one other uh, issue, transition to one other thing I'd like to, to hear Ray talk about. Sure. Yeah. Um, and is that, is that okay with you, Kiva? I mean, let's. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm, that was, I'm I enjoying it. I didn't want to give short walk. shrift to that. I didn't want to give short shrift to that story. No, no, no. I think that's. A, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Okay. Well, as a, as, as a historian, it's hard to stop. You know. Yeah. I know, but All right. I didn't no. want to. I didn't want to stop no. you because Me I neither. could see the logical. I could see this logical. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I was. I, 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 you were look, I was. I was. I was uh, transitioning to a student. One of your students. All right. Yeah. yeah, it was awesome. So speaking of students, I'm going to take right. us back uh, 50, I don't know how many years now, I don't want to count, 53 years, something like that, um, when we were together at Wesleyan. And um, so here's this, uh, for those of you who don't know about Wesleyan University, it's in Middletown, Connecticut. It's a liberal arts, uh, small liberal arts college um, that has uh, developed a reputation for being uh, extremely progressive. Um, I, I went there from a, a town that voted 85% for gold, gold order. And it was a transformative experience for me. Um, you went there from <laughs> the deep south of Oklahoma. Uh, why, why did you go there? And tell us about your experience there, uh, particularly about what happened over those four years in terms of racial integration. And, uh, sure. Yeah. So, um, this goes back actually uh, to, I, I mean, I, actually my, my, my brother, I have two brothers, uh, all three of us uh, uh, went to a prep school in St. Louis. Uh, I have a, my, my father, uh, before he died, uh, sort of disagreed with the story I'm about to tell, but I, I still <laughs> think it's the right story. You still so, get to tell it. <laughs> so my brother, so my uh my brother, older brother, is born in uh, 45. Um, the Little Rock school crisis occurs in when he's 12. Um, and uh, I don't know if you all remember, but uh, Little Rock Central with the integration of it and the, the, National, the National Guard is called out uh, by President Eisenhower. But then Falbus. Faubus, Governor Faubus. Governor Faubus, yeah. who I have a picture with Governor Faubus, my sixth grade class trip wow. <laughs> to the governor, wow. you know, Little Rock. Oh. And the, they're not my personal, but I mean, the class picture. You yeah, know, right, right. We were all standing there and the governor's there. Um, but um, uh, he, one of his delay tactics was to close the public schools. So this, it, you don't have to integrate if there are no public schools. So, um, there were actually, I, I still remember that there was there was private fundraising for to keep the schools open. So my um, I, I think, as I said, my both my parents had gone to Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, my father had then gone to Harvard Law School, and um, I think they were conscious. I mean, they were afraid. Not afraid. They 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 they, they worried that. The schools, they, nobody knew what the future of the schools were, and they didn't want us trapped. And the only option was to, you know, was to go to, uh, was to go to the University of Arkansas. I mean, if we'd want, gone, that would have been fine. But that they they wanted us to have whatever options we could have. So they looked around for a prep school. They found a, a, a school in St. Louis that was modeled after the after Eastern schools in terms of the academics. But it wasn't Christian. It wasn't uh, military, um, and so and I had a we had a family in St. Louis, so they felt comfortable sending us to a boarding school in St. Louis. So I went there for four years. 
when it was time uh, to go to, to apply to college, this was the old school system. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we were, our, our class, the class of 1968, was admitted in 64. Um, we were the we were the last that the that the then admissions dean went around and to various private schools for that portion of the class that was coming from private schools and it was a handshake deal. I I was called in the first of September or whatever it was to the headmaster's office and told I was going to Wesleyan. I mm. never I didn't know Wesleyan. <laughs> <laughs> Did you I, fill out an application? Well, I did find, yeah, I had to, I had to post, okay. post admission, but the, so that, that was the way that's, that's how I got to Wesleyan. I was one of four people uh, from Arkansas wow. that had ever gone there, I think. Um, but the point is that's part of the story. Our class, John, John and my class was, uh, and he can correct me if I'm wrong. I think we had one, two African Americans, something two, like that. Uh, one or two, yeah. And right. one, one Hispanic whose family owned Puerto Rico or <laughs> parts thereof. Uh, yeah. So I mean, it was not a diverse class. We we were we were we were, um, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, yeah. But the so that admissions dean retired or was fired, whatever. Uh, our uh, Norwine, uh, and they, they called our class Norwine's Revenge. Right, uh, uh. And, and and the next class, they, they hired a new admissions person. So the next class was, I don't know, 15% African-American. It was, uh, 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 my class had 10%, there were 35 Jews and 350. We were part of the 10% quota that most of the Eastern schools had in those days. It was much more Jewish. It was so it just totally changed. We're still all male, but it, it changed. Um, mm -hmm. Part of that expansion of African Americans uh, was that it was not just, you know, prep school or, or uh, uh, highly motivated uh, uh, suburban high school, public high school graduates were in the group of African Americans. I mean there were there were people from uh from Harlem from uh who had very different backgrounds. I mean mm. and uh I remember, you know, I I was considered myself this, you know, good white liberal um and uh thought I was progressive. Um and I remember it was a guy by the name of Carl Johnson. I don't know whatever happened to him. Um mm. uh, in having a, a conversation with him that Totally, you know, it was like, well, why, why, you know, why not take a half step? You know, why do you need to do violence or whatever? And remember wrestling with this for weeks and years afterwards, you know, because it totally upset my worldview that we were making progress and everything would be fine, um, mm -hmm. and and that the tactics of uh, uh, of uh, Dr. King. Uh, were fine. And uh, we attended, Dr. King came. Uh, I actually got to shake hands with Dr. King once. Uh, he, uh, one of my good friends, Mark Taylor, who's now a professor at Columbia of uh, Religion, uh, was a student of John McGuire, uh, who was a professor then at Wesleyan, went on to become president of Stony, of, uh, of Stony Brook, I think, um, a religion professor. He and King had been in the seminary together. They had been at Crozier or something. I forgot exactly what. So he, they were personal friends, and he invited King and uh, McGuire asked Mark to get four people to, you know, to uh, usher for him. And um, so um, I, you know, I he Mark asked me, and I, of course, and we got to you know before it started, we got you know a minute in backstage with Dr. King, and he was remarking on how, because, it, I mean, we were a diverse group. Uh, I mean, you know, I was this Southern Jew and there were, uh, uh, there, I think uh, one was, uh, there was an African-American and someone, I don't know, I can't remember all, Mark was there. Uh, but um, uh, he remarked on how special educational communities were that, that you know, that they, that, 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 that there was a, a hope uh, for, uh, progress if you looked at 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 
at university communities. So that was uh, uh, that that was one of my. I mean, it was a transformative period in the country, and sort of the the university was a microcosm of that uh, of that change. Oh, it was it was a it was a statement to me that the university made this commitment after our class to um, actively bring people of color onto campus as our fellow students. And, yeah. you know, it, it um, you know, I told the story in my interview of, of um, you know, integrating my fraternity and the, for the first black brother and that, that kind of thing. So it, it, it had an impact across the board, I bet with many of our classmates. And, and I remember uh, his speech, I remember where I was standing mm. in the, in the, mm. uh, you know, our, our big hall that we had up in a balcony. And my only other uh, real memory from that, um, that venue was being in the first row watching Janis Joplin. And, uh, but this, this was, uh, in the long run of things, this was far more important uh, in my life than, uh, than that. Yeah. Uh, so it was really, it was really something. And I think it's something that, you know, uh, has a reunion and so forth. We talk about these things that binds us till today. Yeah. Uh, and it was really one of the reasons um, that you and I reconnected, I think, because we had this right. common experience and common, um, you know, feeling about uh, racism um, and th things needed to be done about it. And it, and it also um, um, is important to think about in terms of uh, the Supreme Court cases that, uh, yeah. Wow. Uh, you know, with affirmative action, it made a huge difference. I mean, it, yeah. it's just, it's just wrong. I mean, it's just factually incorrect to say that uh, you know that 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 diversity um, that there's no uh, value uh, to diversity. I mean, I think a lot of what we face as a country with this uh, with, with the political divisions today. Um, I mean, I, I think some of this has been uh, uh, undercut, or, or some 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 of it has been caused by undercutting what what progress had been made under yeah. affirmative action yeah. in, various, in various areas, and yeah. and this this sort of um, giving uh, credence to this other view, I, I I think has been totally destructive. Yeah. Well, what? I'm gonna wow. I'm gonna. Uh, conclude it here but um the preview of of the next session um yeah. uh, i th think we'd like to dive into your your career and your leadership positions and the kinds of issues that you may may have um addressed uh in law school and the things you did over the 16 years in different categories of subjects uh, mm -hmm. uh that relate to this whole question of uh, social wow. equity um and um and also, uh, you've had a leadership role in your synagogue, and I'd like to to talk about uh, you know use that as an, another you know basis for discussion about um, you know anti-Semitism and that sort of thing. So, um, thank you for for yeah. joining us and for agreeing to do us a next session. And um, uh, any questions for us before we we sign no, off? No, okay, no, good. no. This has been um, This is great. Yeah, it. It's been good. So, uh, Kiwi, do you want to wrap it up? Yeah, so I, I just want to thank our guest today, uh, Ray Solomon. Thank you so much for, you know, the historical perspective that you have provided. Uh, I feel like I want to just sign up for one of your classes to learn, you know, more about, um, you know, these, the history of the country and how it has impacted our lives, both for legal, social, political. We covered a lot of things today in today's uh, episode, so we really appreciate you lending your perspective to the Courageous Conversation. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you for those who continue to view and watch our, our YouTube channel. Uh, please join us again for another episode of the Race to Social Justice. Because remember, it's not about confrontation. It's all about engaging in conversation. So thank you uh, all for listening. Thank you for watching. Ray, thank you for being with us today. And thank you for both of you for doing this. The Race to Social Justice podcast is produced, edited, and mixed at The Dream in Austin, Texas.